Oh, I'm already live. Hello, I'm Claire Snowden, darling. I'm Laura Knowles. Clearly very happy, Laura Knowles. Oh, I'm really good day. I'm just nailing it. I'm well, just not on it. I'm loving that. Well done. I'm not having such a good day, but we can come to that because it feels a little bit relevant. Um, so this evening, so we are the founders of Balanced Wellness and the founders of the College of Functional Wellness and the creators of Functional Kinesiology. <sighs> How come we know titles after your name, isn't it? <laughs> I remember all of that whenever we speak and because I'm menopausal, things fall out my head. I'm like, what else? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> you do something with women's health. No, I've just come off the back of the clubhouse and did the bit where they go around the room and they sort of say, and so we can tell what about you and I go, hello. Um, completely forgotten. <laughs> do stuff. Do with Menopausal. Bye. <laughs> I'm going really... to public speaking at the exact moment. I've lost my brain capacity. Anyway. See, this, this is why I do not want to go anywhere near menopause because I've got the forgetful thing anyway. And like you have this sponge for a brain and just remember everything. And then when things fall out of your head, I'm like, we're all doomed. We're all doomed. I was actually laughing with a friend of mine today about how with menopause, it's like our desire to communicate is so great. But actually uh, what we'll do is we'll come up with 18 words where just one was necessary. Because like you're so determined to describe the thing. And I think I said this the other week, but I forgot the word for broom and it became standing up floor brush. And I was really clear. <laughs> it's just so clear in the middle of a conversation. Thing, what I'm looking for is the, um, you know, standing up floor brush. <laughs> Why? How can I remember four words when I can't even remember one? <laughs> Oh dear. I just think they should be renamed that. <laughs> you <can't>. <laughs> <laughs> Your brain will be trying to make things simpler, but no, we need four oh. words. And then she did say, she did say to me, well, I mean, you're lucky you're at that stage because I'm at this stage. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh God, it gets worse. Oh God, okay. Oh right. God, should we, should we talk about how difficult it is to be a woman? <laughs> Sometimes it's hard to be a woman. Yes, let's. Oh, and then very sensible and bring oh, it back. So, to so, 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 so I, I did a talk on this um, on Sunday. Standing on floor brushes. <laughs> <laughs> it's not what I'm trying to be serious. Oh, it on me. It took me a yeah, the I mean, first time. Just going to point out to anybody watching this that I don't know how we've created all of the things that we forgot about at the beginning because this is actually remember once we were in Spain oh. we've gone off to do some work we were actually with my parents and my dad went do you two actually get any work done and were you just laughing yeah, yeah we produce my stuff Whoa. <laughs> anyway I did a talk on Sunday and it's a fact that 75% of autoimmune sufferers are female. And so I was talking about one of the reasons that it's quite tough to be a woman is that we go through massive hormonal changes in our life that men don't have to experience in the same way. So yes, we both sexes go through puberty, but women, go through fertility, they go through pregnancy, they go through the postnatal experience, they go through perimenopause and they go through menopause. And when you look at the hormone bombs that go off in the body at those times, the estrogen going crazy or progesterone kicking in or uh, testosterone doing its thing, or there, it's just one of the fascinating things that I, I discovered this week is that during pregnancy, cortisol is really high because it helps with the brain development of the baby. I just think that's fascinating because I always believed that because progesterone was so high, the pregnancy was quite, a, oh, I feel really quite st stress relieved, but actually cortisol is also really high. But then when you look at the map of hormones through pregnancy, everything, everything is high. And so after you give birth, all those hormones drop 
And so we see that these massive hormone surges, these different periods that we go through in our life, if we have an imbalanced system, if, if our health is out of whack, it can cause such chaos in the body. Yeah. And if we look at both our experiences of when our health condition started, mine started pretty much in puberty. I know that you also went through stuff in puberty as well. And yours happened at childbirth, which is when the hormones are at their peak, doing their, their most craziness. And men are, yes, they have, there is an andropause, but it's just not the same experience that women's yeah. bodies are so much more complicated. We have to produce people. And so there are so many more functions that the female body has to be involved in. Complicated and sensitive. So whilst I am a radical feminist and I believe in our equality, our bodies are different and actually we the difference. Like I celebrate those differences because it's, in fact, I'm not about to go into a patriarchal rant just for once, but it is actually the denial of the fact that our bodies are different, which stops women's bodies being treated effectively because we're just considered to be the same and so one of the things that we talk about often is that um, men's energy is linear whereas women's energy is cyclical we'll have loads and loads of energy you know after we've bled and then coming up to um, ovulation and then it drops and then it falls off a cliff when we bleed and then it, it rises so actually a lot of women are giving themselves a really hard time to be linear, do all the things, do all the things. But when we learn to tune into our cycle, actually what we find is not massively productive here, really productive here. But if you actually take that, and you know, you kind of put that as a, an average across the month, we, we can achieve the, amount, the, the same amount as men. It's, it just looks different. So the difference is so valuable when we start looking at it. Just society doesn't like you not turning up for work for a week, which is a shame, I feel. And also we've got the hangover of... Things like the body form adverts from the 80s and 90s, where a woman's having a period, you're jumping out of a plane or skating on roller skates. And like I think about those and I go, oh my God, like go to bed. It's you know, you're you're having yeah. a period and rest, woman, rest. You don't need to oh, jump yeah. out of your plane. Jump Netflix. out of your plane in ovulation. <laughs> yeah, Netflix. It's time for Netflix and nice baths. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Yeah, it's really interesting, isn't it? And so one of the things we're talking about this week, I'm trying to actually find the comments on Facebook, but I'm doing that thing that every time I like put on, put it on, um, it keeps putting on us on and we're noisy. So hold on, there we go, I've done it, I've done it. Okay, Thank goodness, we've got some comments, I'll come back to those in just a moment. So one of the things we're talking about this evening. <laughs> oh, brushes. It's still tickling me, it's still tickling me. But it's still tickling some of the people here. We've actually had an emoji of a broom. I can't remember what it's called now. I'm never going to forget it, am I? Broom. I can say it all willy of the nilly now. I'm going to go get out my broom. <laughs> anyway. Hello, everyone watching. Hello, it's lovely to see you. So, one of the very exciting things that we're talking about this evening is this realization that women's bodies are different. And one of the things that I find so shocking is women's medication isn't tested on women because there was a whole load of research done on it because women are difficult. We're not very good control and co-controlled case studies because guess what? Our hormones change every two and a half days, which means that you can't really use the results that they get for using for testing medication on us. So they test women's medication on men. How does that even make sense? I, I read an article on this. This is how, like, the quantities of medication that are recommended are based on men. And, and oh. the way that men are just slightly bigger women. <laughs> yeah, all the smaller men. I think that's the worst. Oh, that's the one. That's the worst bit. I know. So <clears throat> what's actually happened now is I, I believe that we've either made enough noise about it or the medical model have started to get really fed up of women constantly turning up in their offices going, you're not fixing anything. And what's happened is the government have launched a, 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 a there's a form that has come out 
questionnaire that's come out, a survey, that's the word. Oh my God. Oh, come on. <laughs> a form, quiz. A uh, broom. Uh, some, some, some questions. Room. Some questions on a piece of paper. <laughs> survey. A broom has been released. <laughs> How I expect to take it seriously. Oh, anyway, survey has been released and it's sure, okay. <laughs> quite important. Sorry, you've been very sensible. Very. So the survey has been released and it's very exciting. And uh, the thing that annoys me though slightly is when Brexit was happening or more recently the census is happening oh we all get that through our post boxes don't we because that's important information in fact you get a little bit threatened if you're not going to fill out the census i believe it's like it's a legal requirement to fill out the census um but this very important survey is being released on women's health <clears throat> and what the results of this survey are going to define how women's health is dealt with moving forward. So what's exciting is my daughter might not go through the absolute horrific experiences, multiple, that I've had when she actually needs help from the medical world. However, women aren't being told about this apart from you know, people like us shouting about it all over socials and i mean the thing is we actually found out about it through our social media um woman uh hello esha uh and the bit that bothers me is don't you think that a as a woman b as a women's health therapist running a business for women run by women do you not think we would have actually been alerted to the fact that this important survey was coming out maybe their marketing is not very good clearly not is it and we had 12 weeks in which to fill it in so if you're interested in filling out the survey and please fill out the survey and it's not just for women actually it's also for men who have watched how women have been dealt with so they're looking for both voices but predominantly women it takes about 10 minutes of your time for some of the questions are in depth but they're, they're well written i did mine they're well written so that you have an opportunity to tell a story have a rant say what you want and it's not someone on clubhouse said this isn't about what we we would wish for it's what do we want because if we don't start speaking about it now we we don't get to moan about it in future <clears throat> so speak up surveys are, are now happening and we've got until I was told this information 11 45 p.m on the 30th of May to get it done by and from this this consultation there's going to be a consultation afterwards looking at the 15 women who have filled it in because they heard about it on social media and then they're actually going to start to make decisions on how women's uh, health is dealt with moving forward. <clears throat> now, we particularly want to talk about this tonight. Could moan about menopause all the time. Spend my life moaning about how how menopause is dealt with with women. And you know, my discovery is that you need a lot of long pockets to be able to afford menopause because very often what the medical model offers, you know, that stuff that was tested on men doesn't work for most women most of the time. But this evening we want to talk about endometriosis because it's endometriosis awareness day, week or month, I can't remember one of them, but then I can't remember the group, so, you know. So let's talk about endometriosis, because this is a big, big women's issue. Yeah, and good grief, it's, it, it looks painful, it really does look painful. I've had women with endometriosis come into my clinic and I've, I've worked with it from a clinical perspective. And it's a condition where tissue that is similar to the lining of the womb starts to grow in other places, such as like the ovaries and the fallopian tubes and the bowel. And it's because- because yeah, it, it's stuck everywhere. Yeah, so yeah, it, it's that sticky and, um, and so when, I know women who go through endometriosis around their periods, it's horrendous because these, this, um, this tissue is very estrogen sensitive. And so as that estrogen rises at the end of the month, 
all of the, the tissue that's inflamed in that area also starts to respond to that estrogen, become more inflamed, become more painful. So um, yeah, it's an autoimmune condition. Yeah, autoimmune condition, but it can even then start mimicking menopause, can't it? Because of it can stop periods, you can end up with hot flushes. I mean, be horrific, like a full on life changing, quality of life affecting condition. And one of the stats is one in 10 women of reproductive age experience endometriosis. Oh. Which causes oh. fertility issues, not just this pain, but like, you know. Pain in the pelvic area. It's um, pain around sex. It's, yeah, it, it bowel is. Bowel issues. Bowel uh, issues, bladder issues, because <laughs> the cells grow around that area. So it's, it, it's, and it can often lead to a woman making a decision to have a hysterectomy. Yes. Now, ooh. So some of the ways that they deal with it, say they, I always just sound really combative and I don't mean to, <laughs> but it's, so we positioned our business. We weren't meant to be outdoor. But one of the ways that it's dealt with, some of the ways that it's dealt with are, let's put women on the contraceptive pill. Now, it's really interesting about that. Firstly, as we've said, there's like a massive uh, response to estrogen with endometriosis. The contraceptive pill <clears throat> is a huge amount of estrogen. So whilst you might put a sticking plaster over the issue, you're not making it go away. Mm -hmm. so the contraceptive pill in itself then also stops the body's ability to naturally make progesterone. And that progesterone is ultimately calms us down, anti-inflammatory, you know, d d makes us feel marvelous. So we're taking away a, a woman's ability to be naturally calm and we're pumping them up on more estrogen, which then leads to more inflammation, excess cortisol in the body, <clears throat> women ending up wired, like emotionally numbing, very overwhelmed, often anxious, um, even just not even like personality devoid, like women really start to notice their personality changes when they're on those high levels of hormones. Then if the hormones don't work, then it's a hysterectomy. But the problem is that the hysterectomy doesn't deal with the issue either, because very often this autoimmune condition, we're going to talk a bit about autoimmune in a moment, but the autoimmune condition has actually often come about because of estrogen dominance. <clears throat> well, the estrogen has become dominant because of too little progesterone, too much stress in the body, <coughs> ultimately what causes it. The estrogen dominance doesn't go away because you take out the womb and the ovaries because the bit that's overlooked by the medical world is not, it's not just our ovaries that make estrogen, it's also our adrenal glands. So if we're making too much estrogen, guess what? Even if you take away our uterus and ovaries, which is a whole other kettle of fish, we're still going to be estrogen dominant. And then those women are forced into an early menopause, horrific, <clears throat> And very often given estrogen, HRT, not progesterone because we've got no longer got uterus, which actually is one thing that we need. So more estrogen dominance. And it's actually quite frightening when you start looking at <clears throat> then the prevalence of breast cancers from people that have had their uteruses removed, even if they don't end up on the HRT because they were estrogen dominant and the estrogen dominance has then moved on to cause breast cancer. Like this is not a way to deal with it. I know I'm not a doctor and I'm probably missing some of the nuances of the science, but none of that makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. I, th I think the, the approach is where's the problem? Oh, it's periods, it's the womb, therefore let's remove that. And it's, it's miss the bit that's missing for me is this is a dysfunction that's happening with the immune system. And the thing that I'm really interested in when it comes to the immune system is why is it doing that? So this is the thing about autoimmune is that it is described as the body attacking itself. And I, I, I'm doing the research on this. I can't find it anywhere, but I'm honestly, if, if we, if I ever do a research study, it's going to be on 
how autoimmune works in the body because I have my understanding of the body is the body is so clever and it wouldn't choose to de destroy itself there's a reason why it is throwing an immune response at that um, and our approach is we're looking at mm. estrogen dominance so that can be coming from too high stress or the sheer quantity of xenoestrogens that we have in our diet and our toiletries and our household products and our makeup and, and clearing those xenoestrogens out. Immune dysfunction absolutely is connected to the gut. There's been a, a fascinating new piece of study that's happened with endometriosis that has found that women who have endometriosis have a really high level of gram-negative bacteria in the pelvic microbiome. So this is when we're starting to go, yes, the gut microbiome is important, but our body has a whole microbiome. We are made up of all of these bacteria and the, this viruses. So if we have this high level of gram-negative bacteria in a certain area, isn't that gonna trigger the immune system to go, right, I'm gonna go deal with that bacteria. So it's creating inflammation, trying to heal that part of the body rather than destroying it. So absolutely just removing the wound doesn't solve it, doesn't solve the issue. It's, it, there's a bigger, one thing we're so passionate about is asking the question why this is happening. Why? We're those annoying kids, aren't we? Why? Why? Yeah. Why, Why? Um, the yeah, and I just want to pick up on. I personally will go to my death fighting for it to stop being called a hysterectomy because that is, you know, yes, we can talk about it being the Greek word for hyster, although most of the words we use are Latin when it comes to the body, so it's convenient, isn't it, that we can use the root word of hysterical. Uh, when we're talking about hysterectomy. So, you know, originally it was to stop a woman being hysterical as they would take out the uterus. Why is it called a uterectomy? And I like to say that the equivalence, uh, and this is in absolutely no way being disrespectful to men, but if a man had to have his testicle removed, it would be the equivalent of the medical profession calling it an idiotectomy. And I am not okay with an idiotectomy, and I'm certainly not okay with a hysterectomy. So just putting that in there, because it's one of my personal recognitions. But <clears throat> one of the other things is, because we're not really sure about autoimmune, are we? And the only thing that we know, um, and when I say we, I don't just mean you and I, I mean, we do not really understand yet full on about autoimmune. The only thing that you and I know and what we teach is around the connection to inflammation. So one of the arguments is that something has happened. So a stressor, internal, external, whatever, bacteria, virus, some sort of pathogen, some sort of infection, uh, food intolerances, chemicals, uh, uh, persistent organic pollution, uh, all of the things, something has basically caused an inflammatory response in the body usually in the gut microbiome. Now, once there's an inflammatory response in the gut microbiome, something going, okay, I don't like this, quick, let's send the immune system, let's get some cortisol going on, let's get the immune system going on. <clears throat> the inflammation happens, our gut microbiome, our gut itself gets a bit bigger and the tight junctions that are supposed to keep everything in the gut get bigger and the inflammation leaks out and ends up <clears throat> somewhere. Now, what we don't know yet is why it ends up where it ends up. So it could end up in your joints. That's when you'd be looking at arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis. It could end up in your neural chain. You'd be looking at uh, dementia, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's. Uh, it could end up in your adrenals. That's when you're talking about chronic yeah. fibromyalgia. It could end up, <clears throat> yeah, in your pelvis and endometriosis, in your ovaries, polycystic ovary syndrome. <clears throat> that is, excuse me, frog in my throat, <clears throat> non-autoimmune. That is ultimately what autoimmune is. It's inflammation that has landed somewhere and, and we're not entirely sure why it goes, where it goes. But the, the theory that's kind of banded around right now is there was either a pathogen there and the immune system was trying to go deal with it or because it was an area of weakness for whatever reason. But dealing with an autoimmune disease with steroids, with synthetic hormones, 
or just by chopping it out is then not going to make the situation better because the problem is if you've got autoimmune disease and then you start doing surgery, wow, that's then the body's gonna to have to go into massive healing response and you can be perpetuating the autoimmune. And this is where we see with autoimmune disease that let's take celiac for example, because that feels like an easy one to fix. You just don't eat gluten. Celiac disease is, you know, so a response mechanism to gluten where all the little um, cilia in your small intestine lie down, causes inflammation, people get very poorly. <clears throat> so the easy thing is don't eat gluten. But actually the discovery is that by controlling the celiac disease by not eating gluten, the body will then create another autoimmune disease. The autoimmune is just gonna keep moving. So we can end up with people having seven or eight autoimmune diseases. Yeah, they tend to come in pairs. Yeah. Because it is the immune system rather than the thyroid or the, mm. you know, the womb or the skin or it's, it's looking at the immune system and the immune system is our response to external stimuli. It's how the body manages the external and the, the, the internal microbiome. And so the big questions that we're always asking is what's going on in our environment to trigger an immune response? Exactly. It is a really interesting one, isn't it? And we've dealt with it so badly up and up till now. And the problem is <clears throat> there are some autoimmune diseases with big scary names like ankylosing spondylitis, which I always find really hard to write down on my client forms. Um, and they all sound like, oh my God, that's really mysterious. And even the immunologists are like, oh, we don't understand, but your bones are fusing together. But then at the other end of the spectrum, and it, you know, horrendous autoimmune disease, but at the other end of the spectrum, we've got ones that we really normalize. <clears throat> oh, we've got a little bit of eczema, a little bit of asthma, a little bit of psoriasis. We don't think of those as autoimmune diseases. People go, it's just a bit of eczema. No, that is your body in a massive inf inflammation flare-up. Mm -hmm. That little tiny patch of eczema you've got here, or that itchy bit here, is actually a sign of your body un being under massive amounts of stress. So what's going on internally? And you know, when you start seeing people when they're completely covered in eczema or have life affecting asthma, there is no little bit of an autoimmune disease. Yeah, absolutely. We've got some questions. No, we've got lots of lovely um, people Rooms. saving and things. I know, yeah. So what else do we need to talk about? Well, that's... Uh... Okay, so I've got my notes here. Apparently there's also well evidence. Done. Oh, go on. No, go well done for having notes. Oh, Esha gave them to me. Oh, well done, Esha. Hi, oh, Esha. Yeah, uh, there's also evidence that the impact of female specific health conditions such as heavy menstrual bleeding, endometriosis and pregnancy related issues and the menopause on the effect of those on women's lives is massively overlooked. That includes the effect they can have on women's workplace participation, productivity, and outcomes. Apparently the last studies were done in 2017 and didn't ask a lot of the right questions. Mm, this feels so important. I had a client this week who has just had a baby and listening to her birth story, she was quite matter of fact about it. <clears throat> Interested to see if that plays out for her. She seemed to be, okay, this happened. I'm just gonna move on from it. But she said the thing that she found hardest was how was medicalized. Mm. Her, her labor was she went into this sterile room and um, she there was there was no creature comforts. There was no. And she was told that she wasn't able to squat. She wasn't able to. She had to lie down. Uh, uh, when I was listening to this as a as a woman and a woman who's been through labor myself and it's such a vulnerable experience to go through and understanding the hormonal pathways that happen when you're in labor that for you to be able to produce the oxytocin to be able to contract you need to feel like you're in a safe place and the difficulty with medicalizing our childbirth with those bright lights with not being able to get in the positions that we need to to be able to you know squatting is such a natural position to to, to labor in we're 
we are creating a lot of cortisol in the body and that will shut labor down. Yep. And so then we're having to use more medications and epidurals and mm. force the baby out and the forceps and the, and oh, and she, oh my God, and the things that just, you know, things that happen to her body without her permission. And it was shocking to hear it. And I, I've heard women's birth stories before and I didn't realize it was still happening. And I think this is why this health study is so important because <clears throat> we need to have our voices heard because we have to change this. We have to understand that giving birth is, is something that needs to be so much respect and honoring around it and so much. You make a really good point. Like mine was 17 years ago now. And I was just sat there listening to you going, yeah, that was my story. But that was 17 years ago and hopefully things have moved on. Yeah, my labor actually stopped because uh, I, had, I ended up having to go into hospital. And so the clinical environment, my labor stopped. And then uh, just every catastrophic thing under the sun. <clears throat> What's really funny, he just made me realize I didn't actually write about that in my women's, my women's survey because the way that my labor was dealt with, which was awful and put me into, into PTSD, like full on diagnosed PTSD, my labor was nothing compared to the shocking, shocking way that my menopause has been dealt with. Absolutely. I, the, the, the abuse that I've received, <clears throat> literally being told this, don't be an idiot by a GP, that was fun. Absolutely shocking. Like, I think there is just this real thing around women, uh, like we're just not expected to understand our body. So the doctors know best, this situation is best for you in your labor. No, you don't understand what's going on with your hormones. No, well, you, you're making it up. There's so much around that because our hormones are not understood. They weren't understood before the world went crazy. Then the world went crazy, which made our hormones go even more crazy. And so now they're definitely not understood. So let's talk solutions, because we could moan all night. We really could. So I think that the survey is a brilliant idea and I'm, I'm absolutely delighted and I'm really excited. I have sent it to everyone I know. Uh, so please do check out the survey. The link has been posted down there, which is fantastic because it's not even easy. It's like it's quite a com complex link. It can't, it's not even easy. Um, One thing that we are empowered with getting this message out is we are not medical professionals. We cannot diagnose. We cannot. That's the clue. <laughs> <laughs> we cannot make recommendations on medication. What we can do is educate women, educate our clients, educate our students so that they feel empowered to go into a doctor's appointment and with facts, with scientific facts of how our biology works and question the mm. recommendations that are given to us. These are our bodies. We get to make the choice. And the more educated we are, the mm. more that we feel that we can have a voice when we when we're dealing with our health yeah 100 percent. and it's not even just the voice it's the understanding that often you know a doctor you'll go to a doctor and they think that it's the first place that you've gone and and historically it might have been and one of the things that we're really passionate about is supporting women to make a whole load of life choices so that the last person that you need to speak to is the doctor. Mm. So that actually, do you know what? You've actually managed to manage your symptoms. Yeah, we absolutely don't offer cures, particularly for autoimmune disease, but there are ways to manage uh, your symptoms. There's ways to manage what's going on in your body. There are hundred percent ways to, to make small changes every single day that are gonna improve your quality of life. Uh, I was saying I, like this week has been horrendous for me. It was my birthday last week and I had the loveliest time eating food that I would never usually eat. Like it was just delicious. And it was mostly PFC. I did post some of it, but like I had a cheese fondue and no wheat because the wheat just absolutely annihilates me, but a cheese fondue. My friend made me the most gorgeous gluten-free cake. In fact, she made me three. And I had, you know, a few drinks that I wouldn't, I wouldn't usually have a drink, a couple of drinks 
for a few days. Just that whole thing. The, this week, I've just barely been able to drag myself out of bed. I've been like, my joints ache, like a proper autoimmune flare up. And I wouldn't be considered as having an autoimmune disease. I had chronic fatigue for 16 years, which I actually do believe is an autoimmune disease. I believe it's an over, um, overactivity in the adrenal glands. And that is actually causing um, like too much of an inflammation, which is basically uh, an autoimmune precursor, let's call it that. Oh my Lord, I've barely been able to keep my head up, like unreal. So by I know what I'm doing and I know how to get my body back, but women who don't and are just eating what they think is okay food, they don't know, no mm -hmm. wonder they feel awful. And so, yeah, we're really passionate about giving women management tools. Yeah, yeah, take, take the power back. Take the power back, yeah. And, and actually understanding that when we're in something like an autoimmune flare up, okay, what's going on in my life? What's going on? Where's my stress at? Where's mm -hmm. my drinking at? You know, am I stretching myself too thin? Is my diet bang on? Okay, let's be really honest with myself. What do I need to rein in? I had the same thing a couple of weeks ago. My skin was like so sore, patches of psoriasis. And I was, oh, okay, what, 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 what? And I had to take a, a good look at it and have made some changes, in, particularly in my diet. The porridge had to go. I love avocado. I'm so blimmin' intolerant to it. That had to go. I had to part the eggs. I miss eggs. But it's got to go because the pain is worse than the eggs. So gone. <laughs> and, and, you know, I've got really like focused on my eating. There's been some, um, I've put some real nutrient dense food into my diets and I can really feel the difference. Really, really feel the difference. My headaches are clearing. My skin is, it's, you know, doing its thing, but it's nowhere near as painful as it was when I was doing, when I was eating foods I was intolerant to. And yeah. when I was working too much, that, you know, it's, it, it, it can be a wake up call. Yes. Uh, okay, there's something. This is what we like to say. There, there is, whatever the condition is you're experiencing, it's a, it's a gift and there's a message in it. It just doesn't feel like a gift. Yeah, it's a hard it's, thing to hear if you're dealing with something that is really, really tough. Is, can we find the gift in this? Is mm. it? But I'd come off the back of a couple of weeks, or about four weeks of working way too hard, being too stressed. And then, you know, birthday week of deliciousness. And then literally my body's like, bam, <laughs> no. Do you think you want to go and do all that stuff? <laughs> no, you're not going to. I'm like, all right. Body says no. Body oh, says no. Okay. So it's about listening. So what do we recommend? We recommend uh, for autoimmune, we like to look at what could be causing the inflammation. That's the big thing. What's causing the inflammation? And we talk about stressors, not just stress. I hate the word stress. It's a bit like eczema and asthma, a little bit of eczema and asthma. It's massively misused and overused and misunderstood. So stress is the external pressure of work, finances, uh, pandemic, kids, uh, relationships, all of that stuff. Uh, it's the internal stuff of, okay, well, I'm ex oh, also ex external, but I'm exposed to toxic chemicals in my toiletries, toxic uh, pollutants, pesticides, all of the stuff that's going on around us that we have absolutely no control of us uh, over, the EMF radiation, food intolerance. So, I mean, you and I have alluded to eggs for you and I, avocado, uh, grains, oh, dairy, oh. Oh God, I don't want to see another bit of cheese. I just oh, can't. I do. I love cheese. <laughs> um, alcohol, oh, caffeine. And I don't, have an issue. don't have an issue with either of those things unless you're in a huge flare up, like body is probably going to say no. So these things that are causing stress inside our body and outside our body, that's what causes inflammation. One of the big wake up calls for me was when I realized that cortisol, our stress hormone, isn't just made by our adrenal glands, it's also made by our skin in response to our environment. Like we are just one big ball of stress response and inflammation. So like looking at what those things are, 
un learning some mindfulness techniques, you know, things like I don't do yoga, but I'm told it's great. Uh, I'm very much better at just sitting <laughs> quietly <laughs> under the meditation pyramid. <laughs> uh, getting out in nature, like how else can you, you know, change that? Then we have to look at diet. We have to look at the food intolerances. We have to be balancing proteins, fats, carbohydrates. As soon as we have an insulin spike from carbs, we're going to get the cortisol response. So that's going to put us into inflammation. Huge connection, particularly for endometriosis between insulin and, um, and estrogen. So this is what we have to do. Um, we really recommend people checking out our symptom assessor, if that all sounds really overwhelming. So we have symptomassessor.co.uk and that'll actually tell you which hormone pathway to start on and you know, to, to, to deal with these issues to take, you know, so you can actually move forward and find management tools. And our essential toolkits that you can buy give you all of the um, tools. That's what they call a toolkit. Wow, we actually named that well. Um, joints, yeah, Trace is saying joints, absolutely. We've had a question and I want to come back to the training that we offer as well because it's not just for practitioners, is it? What is your opinion on DNA testing for nutritional choices about what foods are good or bad for your own body? Great question, Julie, thank you. DNA testing is pretty pointless because our DNA response is actually governed by epigenetics, which are little things that live on top of your genes and will change your genes depending on your environment. So the thing is like, mine always comes up that I'm great with carbs. I'm not carb sensitive. That is not true. That might be historically true for my family. There's also quite a lot of autoimmune that runs through my family. And so my body is incredibly carb sensitive and I have to be very, very careful. So the DNA testing, I'm not a fan of because it's like based on something that is like, it could change depending on your, what environment you're in, how, how you, you, can, you can change your DNA. It's only 1% of our DNA we can't change. The rest is changeable depending on mindset, food, environment, life choices, all of those things. The other thing is, uh, I just wanna cover hair testing because people often have hair testing. Hair testing, again, it's really static and it's going to come up with maybe 60 things that you're saying that you can't eat. I'm like, how is it helpful that if I never eat a kiwi that I find out that I'm intolerant to kiwis? And my experience is that a lot of people get the kits and then they go, I don't even know where to start, so I'm not gonna do anything. The other ones that we hear about are blood tests. People go, oh, I saw a doctor and they did a blood test. Yeah, blood tests aren't gonna work for most people because there actually needs to be a 75% change in your blood response to actually show up in a blood test. So you're really talking about proper celiacs. You're not talking about people with low level gluten sensitivity, which in itself ends up being highly toxic. So when we talk about food sensitivity testing, we are kinesiologists, we use muscle testing, uh, which is immediate and instant. But the other thing is, it changes. Our bodies change as we, so like when I first got into this, I had 30 foods I was allergic and intolerant to. And actually I gave up wheat and like a house of cards, those all fell away. And now there's a few things that I am like, two things I'm properly allergic to avocado and peppers and there's a few things that I'm really a bloody avocado there's a few things I'm intolerant to and avoid a lot and a couple of things I can have occasionally so but that's the more I've got in balance the more I've worked out those things we talk about the hierarchy of food intolerances that there are some foundational things that nobody can tolerate because of the way that they're farmed and the way that our bodies have evolved and because they're highly toxic. That's modern day wheat, even organic wheat uh, or sourdough. So I call it arsenic. How much arsenic do you think you want in your diet to feel well? And when people say I'm having organic wheat, I go, well, that's organic arsenic. It's just wheat without the pesticides, but it's still the hybrid grain that's got higher gluten content in. And when they say I'm having sourdough, well, that's fine, it's just fermented arsenic. So uh, wheat is arsenic. Wheat, I truly believe, because of the pesticide that we use glyphosate, just causes massive microbiome fallout, is one of the major causes of chronic conditions in the world today. Autoimmune disease, cancer, and you name it, everything else. It's a massive issue and I reckon in about 50 years we're going to look back and go oh my god what do we do 
We killed billions of people because we had wheat that we'd hybrid and then sprayed it with this incredibly nasty, nasty pesticide that a lot of countries are banning. The UK is not currently, which is really annoying. The other thing about food intolerance testing, like you said, is such a snapshot of time. And if, like, for me, I know that if I am in a stressed environment, if my diet's not balanced for whatever reason, if something's off, then suddenly my intolerance has increased. So then yeah. the, the difficulty with having things like hair samples and blood tests, and they're incredibly expensive and they are a snapshot and they are, you know, something could change. And we talked about female hormones. You know, as you get that rise of estrogen and progesterone in the last end of the month, this is where some women find that their histamine response to food is so much higher. And then they have their period and then they go, oh, it's gone away. And so with food intolerances, it's so much more of a bigger picture is, yes, absolutely. There are anti-foods, there are anti-nutrition foods out there that actually we should all benefit from cutting out. But if you're having responses to avocados and eggs, then we want to look at the wider picture. Okay, what is going on with immune health, gut health, stress, blood sugars, hormones? Yeah, and, and there so are some basics, aren't there? So there's yes. wheat, there's milk. Nobody does well with sugar. I know that's really upsetting, but nobody does really well with sugar. There we go. And then when people cut those out, a lot of things can change. But then where we go next is we look at the nightshade family because they are highly toxic for a lot of people. And that usually really surprises people. One of my biggies with tomatoes, like I lost stone in weight in two weeks and stopped being on prescription migraine medications when I gave up tomatoes, when I found out I was intolerant to them. Now I can eat the odd tomato. I can eat the odd um, potato now, can't go near peppers. Uh, but actually I'd started eating a bit more potato a couple of months ago and I was coming on Facebook Live, not like earlier when I was literally like, couldn't swallow but I was kept on clearing my throat do you remember I kept going <clears throat> and it was this constant thing and I'd sit there and go what's increased potato I'm having that a couple of times a week I used to have that but once every three months right out goes the potato mm -hmm. so nightshades are a biggie and eggs actually egg whites are a biggie they're a big intolerance thing so we tend to start but there's no point in starting with eggs if you've not given up wheat yeah there's a hierarchy of food intolerances that we look at and then, yeah, it's a, it's a journey. It's something that we really, we brought into a lot of our training and we brought into our clinics is this understanding that if you don't have the foundations in place, then you're always going to have a soggy bottom and you're not going to be, nobody wants that. And you're not going to be able to build on that and be able to do things like detoxify the body or gut heal if you haven't got your foundations in place. No. And, you your know, bottom needs to be... <laughs> you need a bird but... <laughs> bottom and you know here's the miraculous thing we don't actually need to detox when we're not eating things that we're intolerant to and filling our bodies with toxins right like when our bodies are actually working our body's whole way of that the whole purpose of the human body is to detox uh-huh it's so clever. So this whole thing about detoxing to, to feel better, it's like, mm, then more afterwards. Like, actually, no. The only reason you need to detox is because you're eating foods you're intolerant to or, you know, those things. Have I felt like I needed to detox this week? Yes. <laughs> it was the same. Something's off, something's off. Right, okay. So we sort it out. It's one of the loveliest things about having done this career for 15 years now is that when stuff happens in my body I go ah oh, all right all right I hear you rather than that really disempowered place of oh my god I am in some kind of flare I don't yeah. know how long this is going to last I don't know how long I'm going to be in pain I have no concept of yeah. what's happening in my body yeah, and now I've got to throw everything at it. I don't want to eat. I'm scared of eating. I'm right, I'm, just gonna do I'm just gonna do I'm just gonna do all these things rather than okay. A couple of good points. So Tracy says if I eat potatoes, I get a lot of pain in my hands. Yeah, I hear you. Oh my gosh, my hip pain was awful. I hear you. Nightshade's really inflammatory. And how much of a diet is made up of potatoes, 
um, tomatoes and peppers. And, you know, we're getting people in. Oh, it's shocking. Do you remember when probably, what, 2005 you used to come around my house for salads and they were full of peppers and tomatoes and avocados and really? used to go really, like the histamine, I can see it creeping up your... Massive blotchy. And I don't get it. Because you love me. I don't get it. I don't get it. I don't get it. I didn't know. I didn't know. Well, I mean, back in the day, it was all raw food diets, wasn't it? So, was well, so a massive immune response where I was all red and blotchy, and then like crippling IBS and a headache. Like, mm. lunch was lovely, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so then we would try and do a juice fast, and actually then stop our poor livers from doing their job. So someone says, "Oh, Nicola, hello, Nicola." Nicola said, "How or where does a completely naive beginner start?" It's a really good question. Oh. Um, Actually, we really, I, I really, really, really encourage you to check out symptomassessor.co.uk. It's why we created it. In fact, I had someone, <laughs> I had someone who'd seen us do a talk. And she's like, I really, really, really want to do a one-to-one -one with you. And I was like, check out Symptom Assessor. And she was like, no, 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 I really want the one-to-one -one with you. And I was like, okay, that's cool. We did the one-to-one. -one, and then afterwards she went, oh, I've just looked at your Symptom Assessor so I could pass it on to my clients. I could have just totally saved myself a load of money, couldn't I? I went, mm -hmm. I, I did try and tell you. So I really do recommend that you check out Symptom Assessor. We have created it because we realise that there are an awful lot of people that need access to this knowledge that we have. There's so much conflicting simple, information. Simple. It's, yeah, in such a simple way. And there's so much conflicting information in the health industry. And we're so passionate about breaking through that with research driven knowledge but in this really simple way so in symptom assessor it asks you some basic questions takes literally a couple of minutes to fill in and then at the end of it it will tell you which hormone pathway to start on so the hormone pathways are based on either your blood sugars are out of balance it's causing insulin issues which is causing you know possibly anxiety and all these other things or it's stress hormones that are out of balance and that's causing all of these issues or it's your female hormones, your sex hormones that are out of balance or it's digestion and we need to look at microbiome or it's your immune system. But with each of those um, pathways, you get the option of buying a toolkit and in the toolkit, it tells you where to start. Eliminate this food first, try that for a couple of weeks. Then, you know, after that, then you can eliminate this, but try this supplement and it gives you an it explain, breaks down how to choose the supplements and it's based on all of our clinical knowledge and research they really are actually brilliant we're really deeply proud of them and then there is some of the models that we've been explaining a bit about today but broken down in video so that you sit there and go oh I, know. I get it now I get why my body's doing this and then there's also even things around what exercise not to do on that hormone pathway but what is the right exercise to do so it really is like seeing a therapist but for like a quarter of the price it's brilliant yeah absolutely and and that's if you are wanting to look at your own health but if you are thinking about a career in health where do you start there we have some beautiful foundation courses. We have a foundation course in nutrition. We have a foundation course in coaching. So if you're more interested in the emotional work, or well, maybe you want to do both. And those foundation courses are designed to introduce you to the amazing world of health. And then you can move on to the practitioner training. And we've got our kinesiology pathway. If that is something that um, you want to work more physically with the body, uh, or we have our online functional wellness coaching, which is if you want to work more nutritionally and more coaching on a sort yeah, of and basis. This, like being able to look at people's diets and go, I notice you're eating tomatoes every day, you're eating the granola, we need to change that, I'm going to find you the right diet, I recommend these supplements based on the, these symptoms that you're having. Absolutely, we're very excited. That's launching officially at the end of this month. We could not be more excited. And again, with all of the underpinning knowledge broken down, our gift actually is taking really complex science and making it really simple and, really and, and fun. And fun, because oh, I've fun. 
because we're really passionate about it. And so we, and we're inherently sort of storytellers really. So we like to tell it as a story. Um, and that then you get to be a practitioner who then educates other women to be the ones in the doctor's surgery going, not entirely sure about this, uh, this, this contraceptive pill you want to put me on because I think I'm estrogen dominant because of this, 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 and this. And that's when we can actually start to make a real change in women's health is when we are empowered to ask the right questions. And when we're then able to empower others to ask the right questions, that's, that's yeah, And we can make decisions based on this information, based on this knowledge and feel empowered with our own health. I mean, it's the, it's the utopian dream that we have. It's literally a second dream. It's just really <laughs> um, I keep getting questions about my orange glasses. I did want to mention that it's not a fashion trend, even though I look super cool in them. You it, do look super cool. You look like a total bohemian from the 60s. That's the look I'm going for. I've got flower power in the back as well. It helps me sleep. So it just takes the, the glary light out of the laptop. It's their, they're called blue light glasses. I think I got them online. For about 30 pounds I think and they take the blue light out of the screen so when we finish this because I'm an hour ahead so I'm now at half past nine so when we finish this and I get ready for bed I'm not wired to the ceiling that's why yeah, I wear it really cheaper on eBay I think I've got some for about fiber but yours are oh, much nice. yeah oh, yeah yeah. yeah so come back to us with any questions we're always delighted to answer any questions you can dm us uh, and also check us out. There's lo we are doing loads on Instagram right now. So check us out on Instagram, Balance Wellness UK, College of Functional Wellness and uh, Functional Kinesiology UK. Um, thank you so much for your comments and your questions. And it's been glorious as always. Bye. Bye.